What I'm doing today is responding to Jay Robb, who actually has been emailing me. And Jay Robb was the person who uh, was quizzing me on why we couldn't just take objects, uh, paint this little group of objects that we see in front of us, and paint another group next to it, and paint them all. And then when they, each one of them was done, if it was done accurately, we'd have by the time we have to get to the end, we'd have a a nice the picture would all be in visual order. So why do we do all this stuff about all over the place at once? in the start. So I know most of you are, are, are on top of that a little bit. If you painted a long time painting, especially from life, you're going to understand me pretty fully. Uh, before I go any further, I got to remember to thank David uh, DRA. I won't say the rest of the name unless uh, till I get, I, I my, my caprice doesn't, doesn't care, but our, our pattern has been to not say last names. Uh, so we have a lot of Davids and David D, uh, now David DRA. So, um, Thank you very much for that handsome contribution to the donation to the, to the uh, cause of um, talking about Impressionist thinking, uh, David. I want to remind you all again that I don't, I'm not this, uh, I'm only talking about one way of working. I'm not everything to all people and talking about the grand, the grand things about painting in, this, in the sense of the history, the grand history and, you know, deep profound meanings of this and that and all sorts of things. I'm not really that guy. Everything I say to you is trying to be a practical, um, is trying to provide a practical benefit uh, for people who are trying to paint paintings from life and get all the qualities that are actually there. And, and what we call the truth, but also, but the, but the profound truth, what I mean to say is whatever the impression provides for you, that the beauty of the general impression, you know, and I like that was somebody, I think actually Jay Robb sent to me this uh, thing to listen to it was an interview with uh, Bob Hunter refers to that that what you see in an instant thing as sort of defining impressionism and then plus getting you know having all the relationships right to each other as you watch the whole and uh, so that really he's he considered that a pretty good summary of impressionism I haven't thought that through yet and I've never heard him say that so I haven't had a reason to think it through but uh, nevertheless I'm going to show you David's. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you David's. I'm going to start off with. Let's show you this picture first. Um, of this is my painting of um, that we were talking about. And then I'm going to show you uh, uh, the J. Rob comment. He came back to me a couple different times, and then he offered me to he sent me some pictures of something he's working on, which gives me another chance to show to talk about the same principles again. Uh, it's not a critique of his work in this in one sense at all, and he, he he sort of invited that. And by the way, guys, you don't have to 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 uh, get into an argument with me on video to uh, to have a conversation with me about your picture. Just send it by email. Uh, something you're working on. If you're working on something impressionistically, send it side by side with whatever it is you're working on. A one shot thing where you see the painting and the and nature side by side, because it gives me the most information that I can use to help relate to help to talk about the things that we're doing in the relational world, okay? So, um, and that's what I presume that most of you are interested in. Obviously, I can talk about composition in larger ways and that sort of thing, but uh, that's not, that's not what I'm, that's not what this is, for sure. Okay. So, um, uh, we'll, we'll look at this, we'll look at this um, co comment uh, from Rob, it doesn't matter what the white paint of the canvas is. See, I'd been saying that I can't hit this note out here uh, on my canvas. I can't match the note that's in nature. So how can I match? Okay, and, and so his, the question of matching and all that sort of thing became a big question for him. It, it'll show up in the next comment. It doesn't matter what the white paint of the canvas is. If you paint the orange true to what's in front of you and then paint the other objects true to what's in front of you, eventually the white canvas will be filled with all the objects true to what was established in the construction of the still life. Um, so, and at that point, all the relationships will have been realized as designed in the still life. Now that's the dream world. That's, that's an ideal world. That's the one where we all start believing and why can't we just do that? So it's understandable. And, but it also gives me um, a chance to review one more time and try to bring clarity for, for Jay there, who's not really I think is not really understanding what I'm saying uh, or the significance of it. Uh, it turns out uh, that uh, Jay is working from photographs uh, and not life. And I don't know if he's painting with somebody who has you do that sort of thing. Um, but you don't have to deal with this problem if somebody sends you a photograph. So let me explain what the problem is. I call this one hitting the unhittable note. <laughs> 
because because we have to be able to, as a, as it were, paint the sun with the yolk of an egg. So hitting the unhittable note means you ha when there's a note out there in front of you that you can actually literally can't match, so that it looks the same on your canvas as it does in nature, which is a huge number of notes. If you're looking at a window, you can't hit those notes. You can't get those values. You can't get to the to the relative contrast. You can't none of it. I mean, not to, I take that all back. The relative contrast. We can do relative all day long. That's what we do do. But um, so yeah. So this problem really doesn't exist. If what? Well, if the camera already has done that for you, right? <laughs> what happens with a camera is it does that. It it just figures out a way to generalize everything, and so the relationships stay the same. It's exactly what you have to do as a painter. But some people like to just abrogate that job to the uh, camera, you know. And uh, impressionist, once you've been painting this way from life, you won't even think about doing that because there's nowhere near the magic. This latent there, and secondly, as I said, you you don't have these options of how to do this and, and 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 choices you can make this way or that way. The camera did it for you. Now, I suppose if you were some kind of a genius with a canvas, the camera, you might be able to a genius. Well, I mean, just well educated, uh, you might be able to, um, uh, you know, to make to make to 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 get the camera, uh, the resolutions in the camera, to be more what you would like to have done if you did that, if you're painting from life. Um, I was talking to a, uh, one of my uh, former students this week who was working on a, on a, on a portrait, and, uh, and, but she was doing what most people are doing today, and that is painting it from you know some, some job she got from something like Portraits Incorporated, and they send you the photograph, or, or it's presumed that you will go take a photograph because the sitters don't want to sit and that sort of thing. For those sitters who don't want to sit, right? And so there's a whole body of work that will go right out the window. I don't do it. I only work with sitters, so just so you all know. I mean, meaning uh, that limits the number of jobs you'll see. Doesn't mean I don't have enough to be to keep me happy. But uh, um, in any case, she's dealing with this issue of 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 of, of sort of evenness in, in her work and not having enough of the variations. That we call the visual order, you know, the variations in edge and the other things that are true. And she was thinking of it as a defect in herself that she actually painted things too even, too flat, edges too similar and contrast too similar and all those sorts of things. And, and there's, so a lot of people have the idea that a unity in a picture is making things more similar so that they, <laughs> shall we say, assimilate? So that they, so they just merge together and look unified? Well, that's not what she's talking about. What she's talking about is uh, which, it was a piece of her background with books. It was a library wall. And uh, she was saying that, uh, how can I make this have more of that in it? You know, that what we're talking about, visual order and stuff. And I said, well, as long as you're working from this photograph, you can't. Because the photograph has already done that for you. It's made that decision. <laughs> now, you can make the visual order of that, whatever image you're given, you can make that visual order that is given, to, that's, that's, that's provided for you in that shot. Yeah, you can do a better job of getting the edge to the edge and that sort of thing and the contrast to the contrast and these comparisons and getting the relationships of chroma. You can do a better job of that, one can, but you won't get the same qualities that you're going to get by the thing that we do in, in our kind of painting, which is, which is use a simultaneity of field so your eye is never doing this thing that a camera does, which is focusing on the model and killing the background, shall we say. And uh, uh, we actually choose not to do that. And that's a funny thing. A lot of people may choose to do it. The heavy hand of the camera is on all over everything today. So I'll mention that. But it's also the, the camera is influencing you, Jay, to, to think things are true that aren't true. And, and so what is the relevance of that? So if you paint the, so here's this white. And so I'm going to show you the picture. Here's the white. I wish I could put these side by side for you. I should have done that. Uh, so you're saying here, it doesn't matter what the white paint of the canvas is. So I was saying that the canvas can only go so white. And if I'm looking at an object receiving light over here, a white object receiving light from the daytime over here, the daylight over here, it's going to be way brighter than my canvas will ever be. So there's no literal matching. So at some point you'd have to say, let this, this brilliant white, let the canvas white represent that. That'll be that white, right? Well, you'll have to make it darker because you want to get the color of this white in 
So you'll have to, even to get that color at all, you're going to have to make the white darker yet, right? So, but uh, if we can follow that idea, though, and this is where I don't want to really get arcane and bore everybody who's been in here and understands this. <laughs> but so you've chosen something that's false right from the beginning. You can't match a, some brilliant note. As I said, you can't match your white, the best white you've ever seen in your canvas. Until you, unless you turn your canvas full light, you know, and receive full light on your canvas, uh, you're, but even if you do, say you have north light on it and your model is sitting over there, the, you can't be using your, <laughs> your painting, will, your, the whites in your painting, if they have any color in them at all, for example, will never be able to be as brilliant. So you can talk about, you know, lumens or any of those other kinds of things, but you can't get as brilliant as the light of nature. Now, the nearest thing to it, if you're looking at these reproductions uh, online, like my picture right here, you know, that because it's projected pushing light through. I mean, there's no painting by Titian or anybody else that looks as sort of, quote, magical as it does <laughs> with these lights coming through it on these screens that we're looking at here. So there's a bunch of other things you have to consider. I better stay on track here because this is one of the, I, I hesitate to do this because this, there's a relative arcaneness to this. But the one thing I want to stay on track with is that I want, I want people to understand that there are unhittable notes. And what I mean is there are notes you cannot match. Now listen to what I'm saying. If you understand sight size, the idea that, that when you have me sitting here and you put a canvas side by side with me, I should be able to match all these notes onto that canvas. But the truth is my plane of my face even won't be able to. Well, anyway, you and all that stuff, you cannot do it. It won't work. At some point, you're going to have to start doing relative comparisons. You have to just compare this to this and get the relationships right. It'll just have to, it'll just have to be done. But I'm, I'm treating it as if, so, but I, I'll tell you why I'm doing that is because when Gamel was talking to me one day, he said, this value on your painting in the background here, just hold your painting up and it should match the background. It should be exactly the same as the background here. Now, he may have been saying, I don't remember that he said this, but he, he may have been saying, well, that'd be a perfectly good place to start because at least you can match a note and see that it's true. But then I thought to myself, well, that's clever. And then so per, perhaps some of this may have come out of this whole card method conversation. But so, so there's this thinking. And Malaeus feeds into this, Malaeus, the British painter, because he talks about putting a little bit of dab of the paint on his brush and then walking up to nature and holding it side by side and seeing if it matches. That's kind of a sight size method. Like, does this literally match this? And then if I put it all over here, if I literally match this and I put it all over here, everything will come out okay. That is the model for that sort of a thing. Uh, but there's just tons of stuff that won't allow you to do that. So, you know, it's not just tons of settings. Just a glint, just a glint of a highlight off a glass will, will just ruin your entire life. <laughs> so um, anyway, so let's get to this point. The unhittable note would be that kind of a class of those kinds of highlights. Um, but so can you actually take whatever the color is of this cup, paint it all up really good and have it show up over here? So he's saying, can't you just make this look like itself over here? Well, the truth is your, your imagination has already kicked in. You actually are just making decisions you don't even know you're making. You just choose some stuff and, you know, to make it sort of plausibly look like this. But when an impressionist is working, he's actually trying to get that full range of magic that's possible. And I'm talking about for the purposes of getting the beauty of the color relations, which is very much the point of his efforts. The beauty is in the color relations, or it's in many other things as well for an impressionist. But it's in the beauty of the relationships that he wants to be. So if you paint this thing, why won't, he's saying, won't you, if you paint this thing and that thing and this thing and this thing, if you paint them accurately, why won't they come out okay? And the answer, of course, is that you can't paint them accurately. A bunch of things can't be matched, and some things can, more or less. So I've already said all that. So let's just go talk about some of these points in another area, okay? You've seen this conversation here. I don't even think I'm going to look at the... Uh, uh, I do feel like this is being tedious, and I don't know how to get to the next level with, with someone who hasn't painted outdoors or hasn't painted from life enough. But um, if you look at this picture, you will see, and I'm going to try to find that red, happy red thing. Where is that? Does it show up again here? That nice red pointer. It's disappeared on us, Mr. Producer. Where did it go? So, um, in any case, you'll have to follow my little teeny arrow. But what I was saying to him is this white here, I couldn't match that white even close on my canvas. Even if I moved the white over to the window, it wouldn't have matched this brilliant note, especially the por portion that was receiving this direct daylight. I couldn't have matched it in value. I couldn't have matched it in lumens and its projectiveness. I couldn't have matched it. 
So I had to say, let, let this thing be. And this is what you heard in the last video or two videos ago. So do, go look at that. If you really want to be bored to death, look at that one and this one. But there's look at this glare here, though. So are these values the same? And how do we get this glare and this thing to be, you know, this is the kind of stuff that really, this is, this is problematic as heck. Can you really match that note on your canvas? And the answer, of course, is you can't. You can just get it to appear to be doing that. And this, that's why this is rather the art of appearances rather than, as Meldrum likes to put it, uh, Max Meldrum, uh, this is rather the art of appearances than the art of facts, right? So we're not painting this group of er this group here, this, these areas, to match in some way this, and then painting this group to match in some way this. We're not doing that. What we're doing is we're going and saying, look, i got to figure out how I can make this yellow work in this setting. So I have to f put down this, the intensity and all that sort of stuff and get this yellow going and get this one up here that could, would be thought of as some version of yellow, but also in the whites going. And so you get around, you look at all the other yellows, you know this is probably going to be the most difficult yellow. And then you say to yourself, but it's one of the whites, so which is more brilliant, this or this? And how am I, where am I going to have to work? i got to get this to be more brilliant than that, but this is going to look like white, but it can't be white if I use all the whites up here. And if I have yellows in, you know what, then my whites are, even more, this is more, even more amplified in its effect because of all these intensities. How am I going to get this guy to look like itself? So this is actually the, our entire question if we're trying to get the, uh, to, if we're trying to get into this game in a, an impressionist way, which is that impressionism is this big impression you see in this passing glance. There it is. There's that big thing. And, and it's all in the relationships of these things that, that have happened. So there's no factual anything out there. Nothing is literally matched. Uh, the stuff sitting on the side of my, uh, in, in the, to the side here that I've set up here, none of it is really doing this except in relation. So the truth, as I've said before, the truth in, in Impressionism is in the relationships of the facts. Uh, so, the, so it's not in the facts themselves. This is the Gaudy Knight quote that I've offered you before from uh, Dorothy Sayers. Her, her history teacher says the relationships of the facts are just as important as the facts themselves. Well, the fact is, you could say, this is a yellow. The fact is, this is a yellow with more green in it, right? And so the relationships of these two facts are what make them what they are, right? There is no, we, we don't have the opportunity to say, let's get green X. We don't have that opportunity. We have the opportunity, though, to say that of all my yellows here, let's make sure that the, 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 the one most filled with blues and similarly may be saturated with the one less filled with blues with, that have the option, that have the extra hop given them by the, by the warms. I say a hop is the projectiveness to your eye. Uh, I have to be able to make these both do this sing thing, right? And be right in color to each other. So I have to set them out there. Now, what I have to do, though, is I have greens to relate this yellows to. I need to actually do this. Will it all come out okay? And this is uh, Rob's contention. If I just paint this factually and this factually. But the one thing he says, though, is that the decibels or whatever it is, that, that, the, 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 the stuff of nature... Uh, if we can see it with our eyes, then we can paint it with pigments. That's the flaw in your thinking, Jay, because pigments are dead things, comparatively speaking. There is no light in white. <laughs> it's just a value, a value. It's a random value. It's just the lightest one we can make, the one that's the, the least dark of all the values. And as I said, if you put yellow into it, it gets darker. Any other color, you want to make it a cool version, it gets seriously more dark, right? And you do want your lights, if you're going to real impressionist, those, these lights all have color differences, right? So for you to see that, it's kind of a big deal. For you to get that, it's kind of a big deal. So let's go to your second question, uh, which is this one. I think a lot of problem here in having listened to my video and even ha listened to one of my, another of my emails is what does it mean to match colors? What does impossible to match or literally match mean? You comment that none of the lightest notes in my still life matched the values I saw in nature. <clears throat> they were impossible to match. Now, this is where, where um, Ajay a, a is really on track. So what, wh why would that be? My inner scientist is creeping out. Color is just a wavelength of light. If you see it, it's in the visual spectrum, visible spectrum. If it's in the visible spectrum, there is some combination of pigments that will yield the same wavelength to your eyes. Now that's where your flaw is right there. It's very simple. Uh, for a chemist, you should be able to figure, see that one right away. You ought to be able to paint it. Are you, this is again, listen to Degas. We're painting the sun with the yolk of an egg. <laughs> you know that the wavelength, whatever you're talking about, if it's wavelength, there are 10 other things. The sun cannot be, 
the pigments here do not shine like the sun. <laughs> they haven't got the, they can't do it. They haven't got what it takes. Even when the sun hits an object, bounces off, you know, that can't be hit with lots of, lots of those can't be hit with our pigments, right? In fact, most of them probably can't be. So we can, you can kid yourself a lot, but that's the problem. That's the thing you have to do. You have to really understand the visual world. You have to get out of the idea of, of um, that we can do things like this. We can actually make things match. So here's an idea. I'll send you a photo in the painting I did from the photo. It's the latest piece I've done and probably the best rendering I've achieved. I know the painting from photos is anathema to you, but I'm willing to learn from it. Critique it in a video if you like. No holds barred. The painting and the photo are attached to the email. And here it is. He gave it to me. Oops, I didn't mean to stop with. <laughs> That'd be nice if that were it. Where did I, where did I lose his thing? Uh-oh. There it is. All right. So um, now there's two things I have to say right here, and I'm just going to use this as a vehicle. I'm not going to try to pick on any on Jay. In fact, what he's done is is plausible in a number of ways, except for a couple of things. But I'm just going to use this to talk about the things we're talking about in another way. Okay. So uh, if these two are, if this is what you were given, the assignment you're given, and you feel that you've made a likeness in this this side by side shot, which is by the way the best way to send it is send your photograph side by side. With whatever you use, including if it's a photograph, I mean, send the photograph of your work side by side with the photograph you worked from, and then we can have this chat better. But you sent two different shots, so you leave me and our viewers at a disadvantage. We can't figure this out whether this is actually the camera that's causing this to look false or it's you. But for one thing, and that is that there is no thing like this. This is this is your painting. I'm taking it. There's no thing like this in this thing. So I think you sent me the wrong photograph. But I'm going to do this anyway because I can still talk about stuff. I mean. And if you think that your job is to invent, right, what well, you're trying to learn how to see, uh, you can see reasons in here why you might want to rethink that. I'm sorry I'm making this tedious for you, but uh, if these were side by side, right, and he's saying that what he's done here is match this to the best of his ability, I could say to him, have you, in fact, done it to the best of your ability? If you're being relational, you haven't, right? Now, what do I mean by that? So this value right here, how do you determine this value in nature? It has to be a comparison, right? If this value, you can see yourselves, that this value, and ignore that. I'm, I'm guessing he glued that in there, but I'm going to have to assume that because this shape is just enough like this one to make me think that he's actually meaning to, to do that. But uh, that he's adding that later or something like that. The shapes, this whole sh basic shape tells me that he's thinking that's something he can do. Um, but how do we know when this value here is correct, right? because he doesn't have it here in this shot. And I'm gonna blame the shot, I'm not gonna blame him, but so I'm gonna treat this as if it were somebody else, not Jay. But you can see that his light is light isn't as light as it needs to be. How do I say that? Well, in the context of this world, you can see that that doesn't have the contrast levels. It doesn't jump out of the canvas at the same level as this. Now, that what I'm showing you is what the relational world is telling you, that the projectivity of this spot is a function of the contrast between the darks and that light. And so if you don't understand, if you understand that, you're going to get to the next level way better. So, but even if he was doing it his way, he would have matched this better. So if you take your thing, you match this, and you move it over here and match this, why isn't this the same, right? I mean, there you have it in your brush. You can actually lay something over that photograph, plastic or something, and match that note probably, and then put it over here. I'm not recommending any of this stuff. I'm sorry, folks, I really feel this is fairly tedious, but there's some aspects of it that are useful. So the bigger backstraggler of this thing, though, is probably this middle value right here. And now, what, you're, what I'm going to ask you is, for example, how do you know when this value, how do you know when this value is right? It's because of what it does visually, right? Um, he's doing this side by side, and yet he's missing this big old value here. Now, if you want to, if when you're in the visual, real world, you're forced to do this little thing called blurring your eye. And if you blur your eye at this, you'll see this, that the major shift in this painting is not, not down here. I'm talking about in this mass here. It's not, but it's right here. It's in this upper middle tone. It's right there is the major shift. So his values here would have been all closer to the darks. So that's a relational thing, right? So are the midtones closer to the darks or closer to the lights and value? Well, I'm talking about this body of midtones from that point down. This mass of midtones, if you blur your eyes, you'll see that they're more nearly, they've chosen sides. That's a relational thing. They've chosen, they've chosen to be on the side of the darks. 
That's simply relational, right? They're saying, I'm not part of the lights. And this one here says, I'm part of the lights. That interpretation says I'm part of the lights. Because you don't blow your eye. You blow your eye at this one all day long, and this will stay part of the lights. This is the light, right? Now, that's a theory based on uh, training, right? That, that, in fact, because the middle tones are part of the lights, uh, we, what we really have to do is make sure they always look like they're part of the lights. Well, these will, if you're to a, a guy who can see relationally, he'll know that what part of this is actually receiving some light. But by the time you get around this bend, you may be receiving, receiving some light. The shadow line may be way down here. And by the way, beware of secondary light sources and all this sort of stuff when you use photographs. In any case, so let's look at something else. So how do you know when this edge here is right? How, see this edge right here? You can sort of look at that and say, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's that. Now this light effect here, how do you know when that one's right? Well, you know when that light, let's, I'll go back to the edge in a minute. The light effect here, you know when it's right, it's when it's right to this, to this one over here. See that light effect right there with edge? That's your leading contrast with edge. With, with, so the leading contrast plus the sharpest edge. This is second to it, right? This is a little lower contrast. And a similarly, perhaps, sharp edge, right? I'm, with my eyes looking at this, it's not the easiest thing, but I'm going to give you the basics. So now, if I look down here, though, you see how he's continued with a square edge down here? He would have said to himself, oh, yes, but I see right here that this contrast goes away. That right here, this again, relationally, this mid-tone sitting here is more part of the darks than part of the lights. Uh, now, how do you get your color notes right, for example, even if you're painting just an orange? You have to get, for example, this orange right to that blue. And you can see in this setting, let's pretend that this is true, that in this setting that this blue has tons more red in it than this blue. It's also darker in the back portion. It's got a dark to light movement getting darker back here. Well, what is that? That's relational. That's relational scene. Even in doing just a copy, you have to be able to do relational scene. You have to know the difference between this value, this value, and this value. Well, how can you do that? You'd look at them as a set. That's relational thinking, okay? Now, you could say, well, if I just match this better and put it over here and match this better and put it over here, everything would come out okay. Well, it, you could say it could, but I'm just saying that's the nature of relational thinking. Uh, so all the sharpness of these edges here, none of them show up down here in this one. Again, I don't know that this is really a good photograph to work for. I'm going to quit doing this to you, but, but I'm just showing you that, in fact, relational thinking is all we have. Even if you're doing an object one at a time, relational thinking is all you have. So when you get into a world that's like my world, let's say even like Tarbell's world, when you get into this world, that orange doesn't mean a thing to me at all its little happy edges, unless what really matters to me is whether this edge is right to this edge, is right to, shall we say, to that edge, or to this or that contrast is right to this contrast, this contrast, you know, this contrast, this contrast, this contrast. These contrasts are all right to each other because that sets the table for the painting. And that's the thing I'm trying to say to you. We can paint the unhittable note, which we could say would be this one or this one, if we just say, let the unhittable note be X. And you're gonna have to really pump it up with some serious intensity. You do wanna sort of by po poking around at the other ones, you're going to find its warmness. Uh, but you have to get that, and you have to. But you have to also say, look, I can't get any whiter than white, but I have to have colors. So it's going to go not to white. But this has got it. This is going to be the white in this painting, shall we say, the white meaning color, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the, any number of these notes actually can't be matched in nature. So I'm just saying. Now he doesn't understand matching. What I mean is a side size conversation. Can you actually match this over here? If this is life. If you don't understand, if you don't paint from life, you don't know why this is relevant. This is relevant only to people who paint from life. Everybody, the photograph has already done the work for you. All you have to do, all you have to do is match. Isn't that great? The, the least knowledgeable among us can be the best painters, right? Must be, a, it's the brave new world we live in. <laughs> so, um, but if you follow though, that I'm going to tell you that these are unhittable notes. You can't match, they're unmatchable notes, right? You can't match them side by side. If the, in nature, if this is nature, and I was painting this picture, I wouldn't be able to get close to that. So I have to choose something. And, and so let this be my darkest dark, and let this be my lightest light, or this be my lightest light. Those become the significant questions. What's my most chromatic note? You know, perhaps you would say, find out that it's this or this, and, or some other note, and you'd say, and I, so that shall be my landmark, and we could talk about anchors for my most chromatic note. And then every other, say red, if you, once you choose that, well, every other red knows how to look over here to get its meaning, right? Now, 
there is a theory then that you could then paint this area all by itself. After you've got all these relations right to the whole, then you could paint it all by itself. And there's a way in which we do that. There's a point at which at times you settle into an area in isolation, but you don't change it. You don't have it leaving the connectiveness that it has with the rest of it. So you first set up, for example, this gold has to bring it to all the other golds in this picture, right? The, the light right here, has to, the contrast and all that stuff, has to be right to all the other contrasts in this picture. Yeah, at some point, you'd have enough information to do more work in this area. You would have. And you might say settle into the area, but the minute you do exclusively do that and settle in and become a realist again, you're going to tear down the very essence of Impressionist unity. So I'm sure that is not getting us anywhere in this discussion. So please let me just beg off and I'll try, I'll try to find some other approach to this if necessary. I would appreciate somebody else also asking questions about this or saying what they're thinking uh, than Jay so that we can actually go to uh, another place. Uh, yeah, this has been pretty long, long enough uh, for me to, to, to make you more confused instead of less. So. Uh, again, do thank you all for your uh, subscribing, sharing, liking, all those things, and comments especially. Get, keep those coming. And uh, thank you again for your donation, David Dra, Dre, uh, D-R-A, and, uh, and uh, hugely appreciate it. So um, again, have a good penny week, and I'll see you in just uh, probably just a few days. I should say have a few nice painting days. We're having really beautiful weather here. The sun's out, beautiful blue skies. And I'm sitting here doing a video. Ah, right, Paul, get out of here. All right, talk to you later.